All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name's Lauren Adams Willette, and I um, am the <laughs> Uh, folk arts field work coordinator. It's four four words, and I sometimes I have to take take a second and think about <laughs> which order to put them in. So the folk arts field work coordinator at Arkansas Folk and Traditional Arts, and our mission is to document, present, and sustain folk arts and traditions across the state of Arkansas. We have three mainstay programs: this web series, our apprenticeship program, and our community scholars training program. Um, and I'll be putting a link, well, uh, Dina, our folk arts assistant, will be putting a link to our website in the chat. Um, Shanita Sanders is with us today, and I'm so happy to have her um, as a guest. She's a Heritage Studies PH can PhD candidate, much like myself. Um, we're not in the same cohort, but I'm, I'm happy to have met her through that program um, and through her working with Arkansas Folk and Traditional Arts, really. Um, her dissertation project is titled African American Theater and Performance History in the Arkansas in Arkansas and the Mississippi River Delta. Um, she recently accepted a position to serve as a teacher corps fellow um, in the state of Arkansas, and she'll be um, working at the Carroll Smith Elementary School in Osceola. Um, so that's really exciting news for her. Today we're going to talk about um, heritage and heritage tourism a little bit, as well as best practices for a successful internship as a student and, and specifically get into some of the different work that she did at the Eddie May Heron Center um, in the last few months. It was from, um, what, January through May, or did you start in December? It was December. Um, as far as the official project start? Yeah, um, well, how long? It was December through May in my memory. Well, actually, we started a little bit before then because I started doing some of the initial planning meetings back around um, the very end of September oh, and wow. then okay. into October. Um, and then, of course, we planned the biggest event in December was the open house right. to kind of, you know, inform people about the updates that were going to be happening at the Eddie Meharan Center. Well, I'm I'm trying to shorten it and I apologize. So um okay. yeah, so anyway, so I first of all, let's um do you want to add in anything about um your background or talk about how you came to heritage studies and and just sort of this line of work? Okay. Well, um, as far as my background, to just kind of simplify it, I have, uh, I've always found myself interested in culture and the arts and history. And when I came back to Arkansas State University after spending a few years away and just kind of living life and um, becoming a mom, I found out about the Heritage Studies program. And when I started reading more into the program, I realized I think this is something that would put all of my interests into one thing and I would be able to expand some of my knowledge and experiences yeah. with it. So um, <clears throat> that's how I became a part of the Heritage Studies uh, program as a um, as a student. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So um you just finished um, an internship which lasted quite a while at the Eddie May Heron Center. So you want to tell us just a little bit about like how you would talk about the Eddie May Heron Center and, mm -hmm. and what you were doing during that internship? Okay. Well, <clears throat> during my internship with the Eddie May Heron Center, um, one of the things that brought me to the project was to talk about... Um, the updates of wanting to make the center more vibrant as far as their exhibitions. You know, when I first came to the center and visited, it was such a warm feeling of all of the, the nostalgia that you could just feel when you walk into the space. And I was really excited about being able to be a part of it because this is a site that's nationally recognized. And, you know, it's right here in our own little corner um, of the state. So 
it was such an honor to be able to be a part of this as a project, as this was one of my first projects in museum updating or exhibit updating. So that is one of the key things I want to address about my experience. But uh, the picture that you see on the screen that Lauren has uh, showcased right now, that's the section of the museum exhibit that I was able to work with the team on. And um, one of the things about it was the Eddie Mahern Center, outside of it being a school, there was a history before that where it was a church. So the church area or the church history that was uh, used that Lauren showed a few minutes ago, that was what I got a chance to update on. And in the process, we wanted to make for sure that we not only showcased some of the history of that space before it was a school, but we wanted to show how it blended and transitioned in from being the church space to being a uh, what it became as a school for the Black students in Pocahontas. Apologies for my technical difficulties there. <laughs> uh, oh, it's technology, it's okay. <laughs> so the, um, I was thinking I was gonna show the Eddie May Heron Center website and I'll just do that here in a second. Um, but the Eddie May Heron Center, it, it, for anyone who doesn't know, is um, a museum and community center in Pocahontas, Arkansas, that is dedicated to um, preserving and sharing the history of African Americans in specifically Randolph County, Arkansas, but also the state. And um, the center also has information about just African American history around the nation as well. Um, it's a it's a wonderful um, place to educate yourself on local, local history. So, yeah, so this is the, the corner that is just about the church, like you were saying, and, and that's the whole, um, uh, but I want to show also a close up of the reader rail. Yes. One of the main things that we talked about when we were doing the update for the center is we wanted to make for sure we had something that all of the visitors and guests could read and really immerse themselves into the story outside of just seeing the artifacts there. Um, so with the reader rail, it talks about the history. You see pictures of old pictures of the building, and you also see people in their function um, as attending it as a church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I love the way that this came out. So, um, but before we, I, and I want to ask you some specific questions about sort of getting the information ready for that. But um, first, I want to backtrack a little bit and um, Mm. I wanted to give you a chance. You mentioned that the center is nationally recognized. So I wanted to kind of jump on that. My my questions are getting out of order. So, um, but the Eddie May Heron Center has received national attention uh, through the 2023 Smithsonian Folklife Festival. Mm -hmm. um, their annual hog butchering was featured um, de during that and um, and they also made a, the Smithsonian also made a short documentary about it. And then in 2024, um, Miss Pat Johnson, the founder and director at the center, um, has received the best Lomax Haas National Heritage Fellowship Award. Um, and so, so it's two ways that the center has a national, um, spotlight and there should be some links in the chat for some more information about, um, about that, but about those two recognitions. So I, but I'm wondering, Shanita, is what did, and when you went in, it had already happened, like the, the Smithsonian Folklife Festival had already happened, and then Miss Pat got the award during your internship. Um, so how did that affect your approach at coming into the museum as a student? Well, when I first came in, um, obviously, naturally, I, as a student, am a researcher. So I started researching information. I found the website. I started reading more about the center, found that there was um, a couple of books that were written about the center and its history. And when I was 
really when it was brought to my attention about all of the other national recognitions and then the awards that were going to be presented to Ms. Pat, I wanted to make for sure that not only was I participating in this project in a way that was helpful for the physical location, but I also wanted to make for sure I maintained the integrity of the the historical aspect of it, since it is a nationally historic registered site, I wanted to make for sure that everything that was put into that particular space was going to be representative of the history, not only for that site, but just in general. So my main focus was to make for sure that I was being as authentic as I could to the project and the demands and also the requirements of what it meant. Yeah. Um. So once I I feel like too, um, to you know that it could be difficult to come into a place that's new to you because it's right you hadn't been to the Eddie May Heron Center before you learned about the internship. No, I I had um a previous a, a oh, meeting yeah. with Miss Pat. I had a previous meeting with Miss Pat, but I hadn't actually been to the center. Right. Um, so coming into the center, I was brand new. Um, when I walked in it, like I told her from day one, it, it feels bright, even though there is a level of, um, I guess you would say dark history about the center and why it was used. It, it feels bright. It feels, you feel the spiritual presence when you walk in there. So, um, coming in there, it was very important that I did my best work, uh, to help and assist, but also making for sure that, I um I wanted to keep that same energy. You know, I didn't want to bring something in that felt too calculated. I wanted it to feel like, oh, this has been here before. Okay. Yeah. So, but so you when you come in though, you you know, it's a little overwhelming. It can be difficult to create um connections and and then also be able to to come out and say oh well here are here are my ideas I just walked into this place here are my ideas for how to change it mm -hmm. uh, pretty quickly and I wonder if you could speak to how you navigated those difficulties and and were successful because you I know you have the reader rail that we showed but there is another one that's been ordered and is in the or is being ordered and is in the works as well so I you know you did you did do some reorganizing. Yes. Well, I think just in general, in, you know, this, this is good advice when you're working with group projects or whether you are working um, in, you know, any type of situation where you're working with a group or a team, you, you want to make for sure that you welcome everyone's ideas and input. And then you also want to make for sure that you're respectful of the people that were there before you. Um, when I came into the place, I knew that I didn't want it to be something that, oh, okay, I come in, I was hired as the quote expert in this since I am a heritage student. So here I am coming into this space and let me take this here and let's put hit this here and let's do that. I didn't want to do that because I knew that just from me not having lived that experience, I knew there were some things that I were going, I was going to approach from a modern lens. So that's why I wanted to make for sure in navigating the, the updating and making for sure that we bought some of the new materials, but also kept the older materials that were already there. It was a blend of everybody's ideas and how we can modernize the concept. So I, I guess just to say that I was making for sure that I was mindful of and respectful of everyone's input because after all, um, this initiative was started about 20, what, 22 years ago almost. So we had, I mean, I had some, I already had a foundation there. So it wasn't like I was starting from scratch. There was a foundation of 22 years that I wanted to make for sure that we didn't just wipe away. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So once you had your bearings and you had kind of made these connections and and kind of had your had your feet under you, what were the next steps that you took um, to, 
you know, start actually creating the reader rails? What, what, what'd you do next? And I'll pull well, up the reader rail again. Okay. Um, the first thing that I did after we had one of our team meetings and we talked about the idea of getting the reader rail, I immediately started doing some research. And this is where, you know, Miss Mary, Miss Pat could, and, and even you can attest that I started sending emails with the links of, hey, what do you think of this sample? What do you think of that sample? And then from there, uh, when we decided on that we wanted to work with Upland Exhibits uh, that's based out of Kansas, uh, and we thought that their product would be best to fit in the center for the space and the accessibility, we went from there and we started preparing the text that was going to go on the reader rail, making for sure that it was edited in a way that told the story, but it wasn't overwhelming for the viewer. And we collected the pictures. And once I established the communication in that, hey, we want to work with Upland Exhibits, we want to work with you all to get our reader rail, it was just a process of communicating virtually. And they were even surprised. They, I remember the first time I reached out, they said, oh, we're so happy to work with you all. And how did you all find out about us? And I'm like, uh, Google. <laughs> so it was so fun. Yeah, yeah, the text, um, and they seemed like they were really nice to work with mm -hmm. um, in just the emails and things that I saw, because after, as um, as part of my duties at AFTA, I've been um, lightly, very lightly involved in this internship um, and and helped the center find, find Shanita. So, um, but what I was going to ask is the, the text, is I mean it's pretty short you have a lot of information that you have to squeeze in there was mm -hmm. that were, were there difficulties in in fitting it all in um the thing that I ran across and um I, I, I really don't have this challenge as a person that has uh kind of a media background I tend to get to the point <laughs> My thing is learning when to make for sure you have enough information, but not putting too much that it becomes overwhelming. Um, I know that they have a specific way that they format things, and I wasn't really privy to that information because by the time they gave us the draft, they had already showcased how it was going to be placed on the reader rail. But I know that in typical fashion and in, you know in the industry standards they have a certain limit of text the size um the type and all of those things that that make it easy to read and also that um help for people to keep their attention because i mean we live in a fast paced world and the average person especially if they're coming in with the visuals all around them they're not going to sit there and read something that's really really long. So the only challenge I would say is making for sure that we didn't leave out important parts so people would understand the transition of what happened from the beginning of it being a church um, usage up until it, like, as it says at the end of it, the decline of the church operations. We just wanted to make for sure that we included all the pieces of the story, but yet didn't have the unnecessary parts. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned something else um, earlier, and I don't I don't know if it's um, my my office is kind of bright, so I, I don't know how well you guys can see. But you mentioned that this is a national historic site. Of, it's on the registry. And mm -hmm. so that means that there are some some rules and regulations in place um, about what you can and can't do. Did did any of that cause any difficulty in, in planning or, or what were, I guess what I really want to know is what did you have to do to plan around like the, um, the not covering the boards on the walls, things like that. Okay. So, uh, yes, like you mentioned, um, in the picture to my left is the one that's showing <clears throat> the people that were original members of the church when it was in the church operation. And, those are wooden boards that are original to the building. So with it being a national historic site, there are some things that you can't do when you're doing any type of updating or uh, remodeling that will remove 
the, I guess you say the history of the site itself. So when we were getting ready to decide how we wanted to put the graphics on the wall, we kind of already had to use the method that was already in place with the center, which was putting, we decided to take those photos and we blew them up where they would all be around the same size. And then we added placards underneath it. So it, it would tell also a little bit about their story because originally it had their names, but we wanted to kind of provide a little bit more information. So it would add to the context of the reader rail. But that was something that I wasn't really aware of until we started working on the project because we had this really big idea about putting a mural. But then it's like, wait, that takes away from the historic element. And whenever you're working with something that is nationally recognized, especially as a historic site, it's only so many updates that you can do that removes that, that will easily remove that status. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, one of the things also is that you're using, I know you were using grant funding. And so um, I think one of your first steps was sort of figuring out what your timeline was um, and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about how you made those plans? Yes. Um as simple as it, I guess the simplest way to say the plans were made based on when things would be delivered. Um, I knew that it was going to have a production timeline as far as the reader rail took about, I can't exactly remember, but I think it took about maybe 10, they said it would be up to 10 week production between drafting the the image actually putting the the wood paneling together because as you can see and it, it just looks so beautiful that stain literally makes it look like it pops up from the floor um that was one thing that we decided when we were doing um the timeline and then also planning the events like i mentioned earlier we had the open house in december so we knew that there were certain things the reader rail wasn't there in december but we also had started working on some of the other elements so that way all we had to do was add our pieces as we went along but there was enough of an update to show that hey it's a, it's a work in progress um <clears throat> and from then the other part was just deciding when do we want to have this done or when do we need to have this updated and you know you have to also consider the client's needs as well because this is a center and with it being a center that means that there's more events other than just people coming in to visit the exhibits so i had to be mindful of you don't want to have something going on and then you have people coming to visit uh the center to do other activities and then you're in the middle of trying to remodel or move something in space hammer something on the wall because uh I, at first, I, I didn't take Miss Pat seriously at first when she said, oh, it's kind of hard to hammer on those walls. And oh, my goodness, <laughs> you can tell that things back then are definitely not built the way they are now. <laughs> yeah. So it was uh, those were a lot of factors that influenced the timeline. <laughs> right. Um. So the and then I think that it might be good to also maybe take a step back and um explain um sort of the idea of the reorganization process right how there's like um three key elements in the story of the Eddie May Hearing Center mm -hmm. yes well the part that like I said the part that I was able to work with them on is the church history and then of course the next segment is going to be the education which is the reader rail that's in progress um, we still have a few things that we're going to, I believe Miss Mary was talking about wanting to edit with the text because that one was a little bit more loaded with text mm -hmm. because it was in the operation of a school, um, but there was a lot going on in Arkansas history at that particular point. Um, and then the other part of the center is just the general Black history that relates to not only Pocahontas, but just Black history in general. So you had those three elements in, in place. And 
where we have the church ending is right where the um, window where you have the stained glass um, etchings at the top. That's where we decided to end the church segment because we have it when you come in and we want to kind of welcome you in with that as showcasing that is the beginning of the story. But then as you move into the center, the next section is going to showcase the educational history. And then after that, you're going to have general Black history as far as um, talking about all the way from the end of segregation up until modern day um, African-American history with you know, Pocahontas and just nationally. So right. those were three, those were three things that we had to consider. So in the planning process, even just deciding how far do we take the church history scene, that was one of the first things that we had to narrow down because, you know, when you're remodeling a space and especially when you have three major elements like that, that you want to make for sure you feature, you have to be mindful um, of how much space you use. Mm -hmm. And then besides the reader rail, what were, um, what were some of the other elements of your internship? What else did you work on? Um, the other elements that I worked on were just the details, uh, of the, there is a table there that's like a communion table since we wanted to make for sure. And it was already there, but we just wanted to kind of redress it to update it a little bit with the changes, and <clears throat> I um, I also assisted with the stained glass etchings that you have up there since it was an AM&E church. That is something that was uh, prominent in AM&E churches. You would see the stained glasses. Now, it's not quite to scale and quite to model of what you would see in the churches at that particular period of time, but it's just something to give you the element of you are in a church scene. The other elements that I tried to make for sure we incorporated was um, on the piano there, you have the lift every voice and sing. That was something that I wanted to make for sure. We already had that piece in, <clears throat> excuse me, we already had that piece in the, uh, center, but I wanted to give it a more natural and nostalgic feel. So I found that on the internet and we added the church uh, stone that you see on the wall that I felt was what really pulled it together because not only is it showcasing a part of the past, it's showcasing like this is a marker. This is our, our monument for that space. Yeah, I I really like the addition of of that um, banner there mm -hmm. as well. I think that's nice. Mm -hmm. So, um, make sure. Okay, so I want to know now. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask some questions about how the Eddie May Heron Center fits into heritage and heritage tourism. But first, I want to ask you, um, you know, what it what is heritage? Uh, what and what what's heritage studies? You know, let's let's get those uh concepts and how you see them um out there for everybody. Okay, um, well, being heritage studies scholars, we know that heritage is a very complex idea and it's a thought. And um, I, to simplify it, I define heritage in this context as a diverse concept that studies and celebrates culture, um, history, and the arts among various groups of people. And with the Eddie May Heron Center, we're not only talking about the culture of what was happening in Pocahontas at that particular point of history, but we're also talking about the history of the events that took place there, the socials, um, the dances, those are things that are going to be featured in the education reader rail. So you have the arts with that. And um, just also just celebrating the culture of togetherness, because not only did you have a situation where people were segregated, but they all had their own, they had their culture where they came together and they still tried to work through all of the issues that were going on and the um, 
uh, the oppression that was happening. So they still stuck together. So I would say that heritage in this context reflects that as a diverse concept concept that you know reexamines the culture, the history, and the arts. Yeah. So um, does I mean you already. Um, so what do you, how do you see, um, the Eddie May Heron Center as part of Arkansas's, uh, heritage tourism or as a heritage site? Um, well, with the Eddie May Heron Center, even outside of its, outside of its use of being a community center, um, it's a place that talks about community. And in the heritage, most of the heritage sites that we have in Arkansas, they feature that element. I believe if you're going to have a heritage site or a um, heritage tourism site, for example, you have to have an element of um, community. And with the Eddie May Heron Center, it discusses community from the past. It talks about community in the present. And it's basically presenting community for the future. So I think that's one of the things that makes it such a um, important heritage tourism place. And the other part, there's not really many, to my knowledge, there's not really many, there's not that many designated spaces in that area that when you kind of leave, you know, you have Little Rock and you have Southwest Arkansas and you have other places, of course, going to the towards the Delta and going into other states. But when you think about Pocahontas, um, there's areas there. You have other museums and things there, but you don't really have a lot of African-American representation. So I think that's another thing that's important to always be able to showcase with the Ada May Heron Center. Yeah, the Eddie, I the I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in for just a second on the Eddie May Herring Center. Um, um, the I I think it's an it's a really interesting heritage uh location because it is part of the Ozarks. It is on the edge of the Ozarks and and technically I guess in the Ozark foothills, but it's also very much the uh, part of the Delta, uh, the Arkansas Delta. So um. At AFTA, we we talk about it in in the terms of being a, an area of crossroads, um, you know, because because you have this this very specific meeting place, and um, I think it's that it's very interesting that also we have um, often the Delta is framed as as being more the the African having a larger African American population and more African American history, and of course there is some truth in that. But in the Ozarks, that portion of our history is left out. So at this crossroads, here is a museum that is dedicated to African-American history and culture. Um, and it opens up this opportunity to really also discuss, well, what does it mean to be a part of the Arkansas Delta or the Arkansas Ozarks? How are those cultures different or not different? And also, if for the Ozarks, who's left out of this this story of cultural heritage in the Ozarks. Um, and so it's it's really like a, there's a lot of things uh, merging all at once in in this place that I think it's it's really special and important. Mm -hmm. um, so do you, um, how do you feel that the, um, that the center is, um, adding value to Arkansas tradition and folk arts. Like what what places do you see where where traditions are are being made? Well, um, as far as the current traditions that they have established over the years with um, the Black History Month events and then Women's History Month events. I see, you know, you have the addition of Juneteenth that's being nationally recognized that they are having a major um, involvement in 
this year. Um, I know that the, I think this Juneteenth celebration is going to be a little bit bigger than the previous years. So we have that going on. So that's part of the cultural tradition. And I think the the overarching idea of it is the Eddie May Heron Center brings more people together than just African American. I think that's something that I've noticed with a lot of spaces that we start talking about when we focus on culture and heritage and we want to, you know, specifically talk about ethnic heritage, we start to leave out other groups of people when it's supposed to be a collaborative, not only a collaborative experience, but also showcasing what our heritage or what someone else's heritage really has done and contributed to society. So in terms of it building future traditions, I believe that the Eddie Meharan Center is going to continue, continuously involve everyone. And I think that's what makes it special because you don't feel like, oh, this is just for African-American or Black people. This is something that brings everyone in the community. Because like you said, it is a part of history that I, like I put in my report, I wasn't really aware of that part of the story. I knew about, you know, the desegregation efforts and all the things that happened with education and um, with Blacks and whites in Arkansas. But the main story is always pointing to the Little Rock Nine. Um, and then as I got older, I, le I learned about Hoxie. Well, then when I was uh, asked to participate in this project, it was like, oh, wow, I didn't even realize that this is something that wasn't even that far from me because I'm originally from Blyville. So I'm in this Northeast Arkansas kind of right at the edge of, like you said, of the Ozarks area. And it was something that I, I wasn't privy to. Um, beforehand, but I'm so happy that I've gotten a chance to learn more about the center and also meeting one of the the former students. I mean, it's not every day that you can get a chance to meet your historical figures. Right, right, yeah. Um, yeah, the, you're right, though. The That is something that, you, I, that I've not encountered in many other places is seeing in a in a small rural area a museum and center dedicated to african-american history that will draw out crowd very diverse crowds of i mean pocahontas is mostly white people and african-americans but it'll also they'll they they bring in the marshallese community yes. often um, yes. and and other groups too and it's it is really something to be a part of um and i also want to mention just because we're we're close to the end of time. Um wow. I, I have another question, but okay. the the every year they do the the annual hog butchering uh, or hog killing at the Eddie May Heron Center. And um I was at the 2023 Smithsonian Folklife Festival and I was just reflecting as you talked about future traditions, how um, the pandemic, you know, uh, and the 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 original man that did the uh, butchering, Judge Jensen, um, being elderly and then passing away, um, you know, almost sort of put an end to the annual hog killing. Mm -hmm. And um, Judge Jensen's son, Josh, he he really, uh, who happens to be a, a white man, uh, he he really pushed and and wanted to continue with the hog butchering and 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 knowing that, of course, it, that's all it took for Miss Pat to continue on with that tradition because she has just the the most passion for gathering community together that of anyone I've ever met. Um, but it it was interesting. He when he talked about that and was reflecting on it at the Folklife Festival, and he might not, he, Josh might not be happy that this is going on, <laughs> and I'm remembering this and putting it out out there. But um, he, you know, you could tell he was a little emotional about it, and you could tell this was this was something that had been meaningful to him for many many years of his life. And when you go to these events like the Christmas open house that we mentioned. Uh, the hog killing, the Juneteenth events, you meet, you see the same people over and over again. You can tell that this is an important place um, and that, and that, you know, that this is really meaningful community building that's happening. Um, 
And, and I think that it's really wonderful that, that you have created a way for, um, for that story to be told, even if Miss Pat's not in the building or if she's doing something else, because Miss Pat is usually the one that tells the story on the reader rail. And, yeah. um, and, you, and it's really, really beautiful. So do you, um, I want to know what, what would you say, um, that this experience as an intern did to help further your understanding of cultural her and heritage work? Oh, wow. Um, the, well, first of all, the experience of working with the center was invaluable because I got a chance to um, not only be professional, but I didn't feel certain pressures of like, I was going to let people down. You know, when you're in certain projects, it's so much weight on it that you're like, oh no, if I even breathe wrong, this is going to go left. So I would definitely say the first thing is I was just honored to be asked to be on the project itself. Um, the second thing is it, I believe it's preparing me and how you can effectively tell a narrative and a story because even though it seemed like it wasn't a lot there was a lot of intricate details that we had to make to make for sure that anyone no matter what age no matter what background could walk in and understand that scene like you said without Miss Pat having to even open her mouth other than saying hi welcome in you know you know how she greets everyone so um that was one thing that it really taught me because we live in such a space where things can easily be miscommunicated and definitely it can be a miscommunication in how you represent a exhibit. So that I believe what I would say this experience has prepared me in properly communicating not only the information, but also the story. Because like I said, we wanted to make for sure that we kept it authentic. I didn't want to add a modern twist to the narrative that wasn't there. Um, Cause I think a lot of times you see that creative license when you see some of these exhibits and it's like, wait a minute, this didn't really exist or this wasn't what was originally there. And it just kind of takes away from the story. So getting a chance to work with the ladies there and um, putting it from, you know, taking the concept that they already had, like I said, they had the foundation there and just updating it and bringing it up to today's standards of what it takes to have a successful museum exhibit. I think that is just an experience that I will continue to cherish in all of the things that I choose to do going forward as a heritage studies scholar. Yeah. Absolutely. That's awesome. So I don't normally do a call out like this, but I know Miss Pat's in the audience. So before I open it up to questions, Miss Pat, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Uh oh. she's probably got some, somebody in there. Does anybody have any um any questions while we wait and see if if she has anything to say for Shanita? And I've got a comment coming in from Dr. Hansen. Let me read this um from from Gregory Hansen. I like how when we present a community's traditional culture from the past that the contemporary representation is also about the community connections and the traditions in the present. It's a living heritage. Yeah, that's great. I love that. It is a living heritage. That's exactly what you see and experience when you go into the Eddie May Heron Center. And Shanita, you you really gave me this um, framing of it more than anybody else. Um, so I'll give you the credit. But I feel like the Eddie May Heron Center is it's a little bit like walking into an extension in Miss Pat's home. Um, not that not that it's like her home. I've never been to her home, so I have no idea. But it is warm and it is inviting and you can tell that she cares about it deeply much like a person would about their about their home and it's yes. comfortable it's comfortable like being in a living room oh yeah like i said it was it was inviting when i first visited i felt like wow this is this is a uh very warm and inviting space 
Oh, there's Miss Pat. <laughs> uh, Miss Pat, do you want to say anything real quick or can you? Oh, you're muted. Oh. Okay, what about now? Yep, we can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. No, I just want to say I'm just so, so honored and I'm just overjoyed right now. All the wonderful things that have been said about the Eddie Mae Heron Center. And I really, really enjoyed working with Sunita. She's very professional. She knows what she's doing, even though I would tell her, Sunita, just, just do what you know to do because this, these are the way that things have been for 20 plus years. And, you know, I'm real easy to get, um, attached but she came in and she done exactly what needed to be done and we are just so proud we are very very proud thank you thank you thank you yes thank you thank you so i want to make a a short plug um in the in the chat i just put a link for an event um on june 13th at 6 p.m um, it's a, and it's open to the public. We're having a ceremony to celebrate Miss Pat and the Best Lomax Haas Heritage Fellowship, uh, National Heritage Fellowship. And um, we it should be it will be a hybrid event. I'm going to do my best to to make it where if you join online, you can hear the presentations about Miss Pat just in case you can't be there in person. But what we really want is people to come out and visit the center. Um, there should be refreshments and we have the Williams family band playing a few songs and Dr. Sharice Jones branch will be there to talk about the center a little bit. Virginia Siegel, who's the director at AFTA and the state folklorist of Arkansas will be there. So um, I just hope everybody can come out and, and celebrate with us. Yes. And then Miss Pat's got Juneteenth planned, the fifth June fifteenth, um, which is uh, the weekend before mm -hmm. the actual date. Um, so there's lots going on at the center to to pull people out. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, and there is uh, Dina put in the chat to um, a a link to download a PDF or see um see Shanita's report about her internship so if anybody wants to read more about that um the link is there it looks really great it's been too long since I've been able to make it down there uh so good to see you see your face Miss Pat um <laughs> And I'm so glad to hear, Lauren, that there may be a virtual connection because I've been really wanting, I've been trying to figure out how to make it down there for the 13th. And I don't know that I'm going to be able to pull it off, but I'm still trying. Um, but yeah, to be able to to connect virtually, it's, um, you know, I'm here in Missouri um, and it's it's just the, the influence and the importance of what Pat's doing down there is all over, all over the Ozarks. <laughs> <laughs> It really is. Yay. Yay. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, you'll be able to see this recording on our YouTube channel shortly in the next few days. Um, yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you, Shanita, for your time, yeah. energy, and efforts. Um, you know, not that the Eddie May, I can't like any claim to the Eddie May Heron Center at all, but thank you for your efforts there, but specifically <laughs> in preparing yes. for this. Um, yeah webinar um, yes. thank you I, I'm glad I was able to be a part of this conversation so I really yeah. appreciate it yeah. Yeah, thanks great. everybody have a have a wonderful rest of your day okay bye bye bye, -bye. bye.